welcome to those for you who are arriving. Okay, right, oh, we're underway. Um, well, I'd just like to kick things off. Um, we know catchment groups can be a very effective way of communities working together to address issues that are important to them. Um, it's pretty clear that all human activity, regardless of, of what it is, including agriculture, has an impact on our surroundings uh, and the receiving waters in our catchments. So uh, many catchment groups obviously have been formed on the basis of a particular stream or river uh, or indeed a wider catchment. And it's fair to say that some catchment groups work better than others. Uh, some achieve more, um, but I guess the thing is by what measure and according to who. So just as it would be misleading to compare the fitness and stamina and strength of a, of a say a marathon runner or a rugby netball player or a, or a hundred meter sprinter, um, it can be pretty unhelpful if we just simply compare ourselves uh, with, with others. So um, whilst the session is about growing your, your catchment, um, just keep in mind what that might mean for you. Um, it might be about getting more members, about uh, being more organised in terms of structures, legal structures, etc. It might just be more about more focus. Um, but whatever it means for you, we'd like to think this uh, next discussion will help grow your group's impact uh, and effectiveness. So the aim of the session is to, uh, is to connect and learn from each other, um, to ask and to answer questions, um, and to pick up ideas and tips that may well apply in our own situations uh, to our own catchment groups. Um, so the webinar, it's a step towards our national catchment forum, COVID willing, which will be held later this year. So we'd like you to, to make connections um, during the next hour and a half or so um, and, and look to build on those later in the year. Uh, we'd really like to thank our panellists who have joined us today. Uh, they've agreed to see, share some of their ideas uh, and observations. Um, as you're about to hear, they do come from a, a range of backgrounds and, and types and sizes of catchment groups. And, and I actually have a, a suspicion they'll probably learn a bit today as well. Uh, the session is being recorded um, and we'll get a typed up version uh, of the questions and things that you may ask on the way through. Um, and, and we'll get that uh, a summary uh, out to you as well. Um, but before, uh, before we formally get underway, I'd like to uh, call on our friend um, Tiao to, to lead us in a, in a karakia. Uh, tia, tiao Ti uh, Orangi Apapa is a Mataronga Māori facilitator for the New Zealand Land Care Trust. Um, over to you, Tiao. Kia ora, ngā mihi ki a koe tauni. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Um, nau mai hara mai ki te hui i tēnei rā. Uh, te kaupapa nui, te kaupapa aroha, uh, te kaupapa whakawhanaungatanga. Um, ko te aotarangi a pāpa tōku ingoa, a kia inoi tātou. Whakatake te hau ki te uru, whakatake te hau ki te tonga, kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tai, e hi yaki ana te atākura, he tio, he huka, he hauhunga, a tihei, mauri ora. Um, enjoy the session, everybody. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tiao. So before we introduce our panellists, um, we'd love to know who's here. So I'm Tony Watson from New Zealand Land Care Trust. Um, I'm ably assisting, hopefully I'm ably assisting uh, Denise Busel, uh, Denise from Scarlatti, who's helping us um, with some things today as well. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, so anyway, before we introduce our panellists, it would be great to know who's on the call, um, where you're from, or, or what catchment you may be representing. Um, so if you could open the chat box, um, hopefully by now you've had enough Zooming in the last year or two to know how to go about that. But if you're able to open the chat box and um, yeah, just chat, uh, type in your name uh, and where you're from or, or, or what group um, specifically you might be from, um, and we'll also use this chat box um, a little bit more in the next hour or so as we, as we get questions uh, from, from you guys as well. So um, it's all making sense. Yep, and we're getting a few responses there, Tony, which is awesome to see people from Nelson, Marlborough, um, Christchurch, Motueka, uh, Kaikoura, uh, yeah, whole, all around. It's great. Thanks for joining us. It is really cool. Um, to see everyone here. Excellent. That's brilliant. Thanks, everyone. 
Okay, so what, what we're looking to do today um, is we, we're hearing from a, a group of folk um, who've got some ideas and some experiences from around the country. Um, as you can see, they do represent a fairly good chunk uh, of the South Island, so um, we, we're pleased, very pleased about that. Um, and what we'd like to do, I'm going to just uh, slightly rearrange things because I know that they've been having a little bit of a challenge um, getting onto the call, but um, so I haven't sort of recently connected with her, but perhaps in her absence, I guess I can give a quick intro. Um, I'm sure she'll join us um, just as soon as she can. So um, if I can, uh, if, no, I'm sorry, I'm going to move on. I've decided I'm going to move uh, on. No, Jane. We're, we are all good. We are all good. Um, Jane is here, Tony, so we are good to go. Excellent. I haven't seen Jane pop up. Um, right, Jane. Um, I can either read your little bio you sent through or, or offer you a very quick welcome, give you a chance just to uh, introduce yourself if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. I'm just um, having some trouble with my video settings. I'm just wondering with the, whether anyone can see uh, see the screen. You probably don't need to see me. But um, Tony, did you want to do the introduction or I'm happy to uh, introduce no, myself? Yeah, please do, Jane. Okay, um, so very quickly, I'm a um, sheep and beef farmer at the headwaters of the Kakanui River uh, in North Otago, and I've been involved in North Otago sustainable land management for since its uh, inception uh, over a decade ago, and uh, we have a, a catchment, um, we're an umbrella organisation for a catchment of um, around about 20,000 hectares in the North Otago area, um, and all encompassing a number of sub, sub catchment groups, if you like, um, within that area. So um, we are doing a lot of uh, a lot of different projects, but the main thing I want to talk about a little later on is our baseline um, activity. So that to us is our bread and butter, our um, not negotiable activity that we're doing in terms of on farm change, connectivity with the wider stakeholder groups, uh, our work with schools. Uh, and partnering with industry and our science and collaboration. Um, so any projects that we do outside of that in terms of jobs for nature, et cetera, sit, uh, sit to the side of that. Uh, very important still, but the one thing I want to talk about, as I said, is, um, is how do catchment groups uh, keep their main focus that uh, projects may come and go, but how do you continue to do that? And that is one thing I believe um, North Otago Sustainable Land Management uh, Group have have done. So uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to learning from other groups as well today. Thank you. Very good. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. Emma. Hey, um, kia ora koutou everybody, um, thanks for having me here today. I am, my name is Emma Crutchley, um, the catchment group that I'm associated with is Upper Tauri Wai. And Upper Tauri Wai is um, a catchment group which is in the upper part of the Taiere catchment in Central Otago, which is down in um, down south of New Zealand. And so the Taiere River starts in the Lamalua Range and it drops into the Styx Basin um, and then it sort of enters what we call the Upper Tairi Scroll Plain, which is a, um, a really significant landform, um, one of its kind in New Zealand. And then from there, it drops down into the Maniatoto Plain. Um, and it's, we're a really, really dry climate. So some of this area three here is around sort of 350 mils of rainfall. And um, from there, it sort of curves around in an S shape, um, sort of around the um, into Strath Tyre there, but it's also joined by the Kyburn catchment coming up from the coming down from the north. And so Upper Tyre Y um, has sort of evolved up the, out of the Upper Tyre Water Resource Management Group. And um, a couple of years ago, we uh, were uh, not a couple, we signed our work program in August for a four and a half million dollar um, project called Tiaki Maniatoto. And so we are um, in the process, still, still probably really um, getting momentum around that because it's a massive project. So um, yeah, looking forward to sharing um, a lot about our journey in that. Very good, excellent, thank you, Emma. Ben. Oh yes, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, Oh, my name is Ben Ensor. I'm um, firstly a sheep and beef farmer from Cheviot. Um, we have a family farm up on the coast there. And um, I'm also the chair of the Hurano District Landcare Group. Um, the 
I guess our formation was back in um, about 2014, uh, with um, really born out of the sub-regional planning process um, in, the, in, in Canterbury and uh, some uh, grandparenting rules that have severely um, impacted on um, the viability of, of dry land farming or unirrigated farming, I guess unintended consequences, you might say, a phrase that we hear more and more these days. Uh, so we became an incorporated society and really got underway officially in um, 2016. Uh, and I guess the initial focus was very much as an advocacy group in the regulatory space um, and, and, and looking to, um, to, I guess, it would affect a plan change that made um, dry land farming actually legal in our district. Um, subsequent to that, we um, uh, got funding, I guess, uh, 80 months ago from um, MPI, um, from the Productive and Sustainable Land Use Fund, uh, fund for a three-year project to put um, three catchment farm advisors on the road, working with our farmers to uh, increase the awareness of the environmental management, um, do farm plans, GHG numbers, etc. Um, also about the same time, we got uh, 1.5 million from um, Tuaraco from the 1 billion trees fund for um, the establishment of riparian planting and native planting on, on, on hill country farms. Um, and so we are halfway through the future, the future Hiranui funding and, and in our last year of the One Billion Trees funding, um, currently um, the map shows our memberships now at 300, or 299 I was told today, so I can't quite say 300 yet, um, covering about 300,000 hectares in the Hiranui district. The map I hope you can see shows uh, the light blue being um, our members' farms um, and the green being the um, uh, conservation estate uh, and the little outline in the middle being the command area of irrigation, uh, sorry, Amuri Irrigation Company, which um, we sort of have a little overlap with, but they obviously look after the environmental um, management of their members, um, so it's not really a focus area for us. Um, so yeah, that's, that's us very quickly, and yep, looking forward to sharing more as, as through the afternoon. Excellent, thanks Ben. Um, Elliot. Kia ora koutou. Uh, my name's Elliot Easton. I'm a catchment group coordinator from the top of the South Island in the Motiri catchment. Uh, it's just outside of Motueka. Uh, our catchment is defined by all the tributaries that flow into the estuary, the Motiri estuary, which was in that first slide. Um, so that is several small river valleys. Uh, the main river or, or stream that started its life as a hand dug ditch uh, about 150 years ago and it's um, grown considerably over time uh, through mechanical processes as well as just the, the, the nature of it deepening and widening as, a, as the flood events come through. Um, I work for Tasman Environmental Trust, uh, if you just flip to the next slide Tony, and Tasman Environmental Trust is a hub or an umbrella environmental trust um, that provide the legal entity for um, the catchment group to operate under. We are funded by Te Ururakao through their One Billion Trees program uh, for 270,000 natives over three years. Uh, we've been funded by the Regional Economic and Development Unit for 50 kilometres of Riberian fencing, which we're just finishing now. Uh, we work closely with New Zealand Land Care Trust. Trees That Count started off the funded project for the catchment group and also Tasman District Council are uh, a big part of it. And I think that the Tasman Environmental Trust is somewhat unique in its um, ability to operate as it does around the country. And so they provide oversight for numerous projects. This, my project in the Motuti catchment being one of them. Um, the catchment is highly modified and consists of huge amount of land use. Horticulture is a big one, apples, grapes, and hops. We've got a lot of grazing land, one dairy farm, um, quite a lot of uh, exotic forest, Pinus radiata, and 
along the coasts as that comes out it's going into lifestyle subdivisions so we've got a huge number of lifestylers in the catchment as well um, which is actually a great benefit to getting a lot of trees planted um, and yeah so that's probably excellent thank, thank you for that um, right now um, Barbara nice to see you um, just wondering if you'd like to perhaps give a quick intro. Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Falls. So I live in Linkwater, which is in the middle of the Marlborough Sounds and between um, the Queen Charlotte Sound and the Polaris and Kinapru Sound. And it historically has been a, a ballot farm area for the soldiers that came back from the war. So they were all approximately 180 acres, but there's been a huge amount of land use change in that area. Um, in 2019, I was elected onto the Marlborough District Council in October. In 2019, November, the then Minister of Conservation, Eugenie Sage, made an announcement at Tahura Pa, or Marae, sorry, um, which was along the lines that the top of the south was going to be um, granted about seven and a half million dollars to aid and assist in freshwater management and catchment care. So at that point, um, we decided, well, we, the council in conjunction with members decided to um, create a trust. And I have to say, I have some personal opinions on, on the best way of creating trusts. But what we've seen is that um, it's fantastic that central government is actually coming to the party with a pot of gold. However, in my opinion, um, having watched and having seen how Te Huiri has been um, developed and, and how we've engaged with the community, it probably would have been good to start from the bottom up and then go to a process where we actually applied for specifics. Um, whereas we've been scrabbling around in the background creating a trust. And I have to say we've been very, very lucky in that we've had a um, huge amount of assistance from very, very capable staff within Marlborough District Council, particularly in, in the environmental space. Um, but also we've got a really good partnership with Ngāti Kuya and with Rangatane, and we um, have had a lot of assistance through MFE, DOC, um, Kotahitanga, Mote Taio, the Alliance, the Top of the South Alliance, MPI, Fonterra, Forestry Groups, uh, the Landcare Trust, Forest and Bird, the list just goes on and on. And most importantly, we uh, initially, having started with distrust from the community, we now have um, pretty much full buy-in. There's still our little pockets of people who, who the minute they, they hear the word council, um, back off at a great speed. But um, the positive effects are starting to be seen within the catchment area. And it's been really interesting listening to all the other panellists, actually, because you all individually have issues that we are facing within the Tehuri catchment, um, things like, you know, dry land farming, and I'm hearing um, from Elliot talking about the diverse land uses, and we've got the same thing. We, we talk about mountains to the sea, um, and we've got, you know, the forestry coming down through into the, the dairy farming. The We don't have much sheep and beef in our area. It's too wet, um, but added to that, we have issues like in July, we had a huge storm that came through and created a, a state of emergency in the Marlborough area. And that's affected a lot of our farmers and landowners within the catchment. So we're in sort of catch up. Um, so storm plus COVID has put us in catch up mode, but it's a really exciting project. And it's based on two tranches. So the first is the land to the sea. And we're sort of working through riparian planting, pest eradication, um, fencing, all that sort of stuff. And um, our next second tranche will be out into the, the Polaris Sound itself. So more looking at um, the effects of sedimentation and stuff like that within the, um, the sea area and the landscape that surrounds the sea. So yeah, really exciting. Excellent. Very good. Well, thank you so much, folks, for your introduction. And I think um, for those of us listening in, we'd be pretty excited to hear that there's a, a wealth of knowledge and experience, um, not only in the panel, but I'm sure uh, in the group as well. So obviously, we've got some pre-prepared questions we're going to put to the panel. But what we'd really love is to know what questions you've got. So um, the good thing is, because you put your names and where you're from, we do know how 
or that we do know that you know how to use the chat box. So now's just a chance to put a couple of questions in there of things that may have been prompted by what you've heard perhaps over the last minute or two as the panelists have introduced themselves and, and just things that you might have, you know, might a little light bulb or something you might like to know a little bit more about. Um, now's a chance just to drop those in there so we'll make sure we can do our best to cover those uh, on the way through. So um, perhaps just a minute or two to get typing and um, we'll make the most of that. That's brilliant. I think go for it, Tony. We've got one there. And if people keep typing, if they just grab whoever's in their group, or if you've got access to that chat box, you just chuck them straight in and we'll keep an eye on that and um, add them in as we go. Go, Tony. Um, well, actually, I, I, I just see one just right right now. I'm oh. going to pick on that one because the reason is what I believe it's not, it's not how we go about these things, it's why. The why it's important. So there's a question that's just popped up about um, obviously important to come up with a vision and goals and an action plan. Um, people want to know how to just get get on and get started. But I, I think getting on and getting started is is kind of uh, come secondary to actually the, the purpose. So I'm just wondering if it would be really good to hear from each of the each of the panelists uh, on that because I think it's a really important theme. Um, and maybe um, perhaps Ben, is that something we could kick off from you because you're you're your group was formed on the basis of a very defined need. What was the vision and the and the the actions you've sort of come up with as a result of that? Yeah, um, so it's a really good question. And so initially, as I said in, in the intro, um, we were very much about reacting to um, some regulation that affected um, a, a big part of our community quite badly. And we spent a lot of time, a lot of energy in that space um, and it was actually very hard work uh, in terms of a lot of meetings, a lot of very slow grind um, to get anywhere. Um, and, but that was the focus and, and that, that's what really mattered to people. Um, so that's what we were doing. We, we got through that and we sort of reassessed. And I think this is, you have to keep doing that um, because your circumstances change, the issues in front of you, some will be common for a long time, but some immediate ones will continue to change. And what was our real purpose going forward? And that is really just to assist our landowners deal with the large amount of regulatory change coming at them um, and, and give them some confidence and some tools and some skills on how they, they can deal with that and how they can manage that. So, so I just guess, I guess for a start, when, when the groups got together or the farmers got together, it was pretty grumpy and everyone was pretty focused in on a, you know, feel like yeah. they're getting beat up on. And how did you turn that from a, you know, a negative energy in a way into something forward looking and, and future future looking? Um, look, I think for a start, it's very much, there was a fair bit of negativity there. It was actually some quite difficult times. Um, but we always said that we needed, that this wasn't just about arguing about rules. We, there needed to be credibility. We needed to be doing the right things. And we needed to be able to demonstrate what farmers were doing in that space. So that's where it came from. And it's about taking that positive and then sort of running with it. How can we expand that and how can we do more with it? Um, mm -hmm. So that's where, we, that's where we've moved to. We still have a bit of a function in the regulatory side, but we're dominated now by just assisting people on the ground. And mm -hmm. that's a really positive place to be. Um, you achieve a lot more a lot quicker in real terms by actions on the ground than you ever do sitting around the table in a meeting room, even though it is an essential part of the job, but yeah. Very good point. I'm just wondering, Jane, is that something you'd like to perhaps comment on in terms of you know, how you go about um, you know, the forward-looking vision and, and bringing yeah. that together? Thank you. Um, well, uh, a bit like Ben, we, our catchment group was um, started, really the catalyst was our plan change. However, um, the bigger catalyst was that that farmers and other landowners and network of people out there were feeling really overwhelmed and were feeling, and this is uh, 10 years ago, okay, so you think how much the everything's changed since then, but um, really felt overwhelmed and um, 
lacked confidence to ask the questions because I guess they were hesitant to go to the regional council and, and ask them those questions. And they felt quite, um, not, not the council's fault, but felt quite intimidated. I guess farmers particularly are used to being experts in their field and suddenly when they don't know something about something, they, they can almost switch off to it. So I guess our catchment group was um, seen as a... Um, uh, non-political, non, uh, you know, non-affiliated um, group of, of people that just wanted to make, do the right thing. So um, in terms of forward thinking, that the way that we have been able to, the only way we've really been able to really align and make sure that we are relevant going forward is to keep all of our, uh, our uh, work streams uh, very clear cut. And I mentioned them at the start. So we have our con connectivity. So that's talking about the wider stakeholders, remembering that Bearing in mind, probably a third of our members are non-farmers and non-landowners. They are uh, people within the community and schools, etc. Um, our on-farm change quite separate. Our science projects quite separate, including our, our riparian projects and our future proofing. Now, this is the one that you're talking about, Tony. Um, and, and and there are no particular order. There, are all those pillars are just as important to the other as the other. So we have our our, our steering group, and we have um, a subcommittee of that steering group working, uh, not just solely working on that, but very focused on the future proofing in terms of where we're going. So um, in terms of resilience, uh, in terms of what sort of crops we might be growing, land use change, um, those type of things as well, uh, economic modelling, um, and that's ongoing support for sustainable land use. Um, and, and I and just to, and I won't take up too much of your time, but just to, I guess the, the challenge and our opportunity for NOSLAM has been that we do this on a budget budget um, of about $20,000 a year okay now that's in total so because we have been very and I don't want to use the word poor but very um, you know short on money uh, gosh that's made us uh, and I don't, yeah it's, it's made us pretty innovative in terms of um, making sure that we squeeze every dollar out that we can and um, without uh, modeling this in a, in a real robust manner we believe we're getting a uh, probably a 10 to 1 return on our um, coordinator time so for every coordinator hour we get at least 10 hours of voluntary uh, labor and the only reason we can be efficient in that is because we have someone coordinating our volunteers if that makes sense so the first five years of NOSLAM we didn't have a coordinator and um, we would lose seasons so during lambing and calving we would lose three or four months with no activity so so what I'm saying it's it's um it's about being efficient with that time and also keeping things very clear cut in terms of um not everything in one big basket saying uh, what's our succession plan in terms of people and activity um, and what's our life after projects etc because I think that at the moment with the environment that it is in terms of funding I think it's very very easy to get swept away with some big big money and big numbers and I can congratulate um, you know the projects that are going on are, are absolutely fantastic but money doesn't got buy engagement. Engagement buys engagement, and um, so that is where um, where we are really focusing and and being flexible enough to think what's next, um, whether it's in the greenhouse ga gas um, space, the biodiversity space, etc. So, um, yeah, oh, yeah. Does that, sorry, Tony, I sort of got a bit swept no, away on that. But hopefully, don't apologise. <laughs> there was there was plenty of gems wrapped up in there, and there's one I'm going to come back a bit later on, which was the, around this trust. I think Barbara also mentioned it a wee bit too, is around you know, trust of the officials or the council, whoever they might be, and, and farmers, and we would, we'd love to build on that. Um, Emma, I'm just wondering, what's your thoughts around this, this idea of gathering people together on a, on a common vision? How do you go about that? Yeah, like, I just want to acknowledge Jane, she's exactly right. Like, money is only the one of the important mechanisms of a successful catchment group. Like, money does not buy engagement. And sometimes when you get a lot of money, you can get swept in a way in trying to meet deadlines, meet um, uh, meet a work program, and then you forget, you forget to look back to why you actually did it in the first place. And I think the importance of the strategy is, like, um, and sometimes it's hard to under, understand the concept of a strategy, but a, a group without a strategy is like a train, the head of a train with a whole lot of connected, disconnected carriages and no tracks forward. And it's, um, I think it was Ben mentioned that um, like the, the focus of groups can change over time. So it's not just something you do once, it's something you need to keep coming to and say, okay, why are we doing this now? Why are we doing this now? And one of the things I've really noticed is that um, 
if you look at the literature that's around integrated catchment management in this collaboration around an issue in a catchment group space, a lot of those um, those research papers will tell you that it's around an issue. And our biggest issue um, that we've had in the past five years is the rules and the regulations which are actually not fit for purpose and where they're actually designed to have an outcome. And so as a catchment group, if you focus on that, it's actually a really, really negative space. Although it's the biggest issue, it's a really negative space. So one of the things that's really resonated with me over the past probably six months to a year is that you need to open yourself up to find um, other challenges within your community that are not associated with regulation. And some of that is might be around like, um, uh, we've come up with like those ideas around like food branding, like, um, uh, on farm waste, um, all those things that can are really positive, and people want to come together, together around those things. And 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 I think, um, yeah, I think that's really important. And just being able to keep that those those things coming in to be able to maintain that momentum going forward. Mm. Excellent, thanks, Emma. I'm, I'm going to get Ben to comment and just on that as well. Um, but it just seems to me I'll comment just up on the comments there from Carolyn early on, given some money by. Can for planning only a couple of members interested in it. So money's not always a motivator. Well, well made point, Jane and Emma. Thank you uh, very much for that. Um, Elliot. Yes, our approach has been, uh, I think, quite simple, but maybe not conventional. Um, we try to find out what it is that people want to do, and then we try to do it. Um, so the, the main way that we, we've done that is by using survey tools and SurveyMonkey has been a really big part of that as well as governance meetings. But when you get a clear directive on what people want to achieve, uh, for example, a number of plants, then you know how many to ask MPI for and you know how many people already want to plant and what they're willing to do. The motivation is different. Sometimes it's regulatory for, for, for some of the larger farmers and other times people just want to see increased biodiversity or improved water quality. And that's an ongoing focus that we keep. And so we use the survey tools a lot to run the funded project, but we also collect information about the future direction of the project at the same time. So we're always up to date with um, the consensus of the community. And I think that's been a key part to our success. Yeah, so just on that, um, Elliot, surveys, um, you know, love them or hate them, but can you just give us a quick overview again of your, the, the makeup of your, of your group and, and sort of, you mentioned they had a, a dairy farm and a whole lot of others. So, so roughly what portion are maybe producers versus community versus others, um, as you may describe them in that broad sense? Um, so in terms of numbers of people engaged, we would probably be more than 50% of those would be lifestylers. Um, but the, the farmers are planting a higher number of trees. So we don't have a formalized uh, subscription based catchment group. We ha have the, uh, the catchment group is open to people living within the catchment. So it's dynamic and it does change, um, but we're not exclusive to uh, a particular um, industry or lifestyle within the catchment. So the lifestyle is smallholders, their one dairy farm, grazers, orchards have waterways running through their properties that they would want to plant, but not necessarily fence. Um, Any, what, what's your gem in terms of uh, survey response and getting the best response? Because we've probably all tried that in various shapes or forms and had wins and fails. Have you got any gems in terms of increasing the response or uptake? So yeah, like you said, survey is not everybody's favorite uh, method um, and people do get sick of them. But the fact is when you're dealing with large volumes of people um, and you're limited with time and budget, you can't achieve this with hundreds of emails. Um, the, you, you, you need to have a tool that collates it, puts it into a, um, an Excel sheet for you that can be analyzed, that you can get um, averages, you can pull data out of and um, we find that SurveyMonkey has provided that for us, uh, making the emails readable and um, trying to keep your questions and, and language to the point um, and relevant, I guess is key. But um, 
it does let a few people slip through the cracks um, because of a barrier to technology, uh, but it also includes a lot of others who don't have time to turn up to a meeting. You know, young families who have just bought land, um, they can fill out a survey in yeah. their own time and they can provide their opinion and, and, and foresight, they, but they might not necessarily turn up to a, a meeting at a community hall at seven o'clock on a Thursday. Uh, that's good, very good. So what I'm hearing is a sort of efficient way to get as many views as you can uh, at a time that works for people, so and, and at limited cost. So, well, and you know what they want to do, so that mm -hmm. when you're trying to achieve it, people are already motivated because it's what they've asked for. Okay, so just maybe specifically, do you have is it a range of sort of yes, no, or click the click the button type answering, or are you allowing free form answering in your surveys? All, all of the above. <laughs> okay, all right, sounds good. But, but trying to put some um, some some ideas together so that they can click the button because it's an achievable outcome is a, is a good idea but um also good ideas come forward in in, in free form as well so mm -hmm. so um you might have said it before sorry um roughly have what's the scale of your of your motor group in terms of uh, numbers working, of participants? we're working with about 200 landowners oh, uh that, okay. that's about half of of the the landowners in the catchment about 14,000 hectares um, and it's highly modified and it's it's basically all, the whole catchment's basically modified there's just about no exotic forest within the catchment. Oh, okay all right very good thanks for that. Um, I just sort of wanted to pick up a wee bit on that theme before that um, Jane and Emma made so well about that money doesn't buy engagement but um, it does allow by having some resources it allows you to do some things you might not otherwise do there's a number of sort of funding sources and stuff uh, there has been a pretty direct question asked about um, about the success or or interacting with MPI around funding, and just wondered if any of the panelists would like to perhaps contribute to that. Uh, we discussion with any experiences they've got, um, just sort of a, a few high high level ones, if you can. Oh, I'm happy to answer that if you want. Barbara, Barbara, we'll start with you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, I mean it's really interesting to hear what everybody else is saying because you know initially for Te Huriri, we had to take it right back to what did the people want and it came down as I mentioned the elections in 2019 and a lot of the complaints that we heard from the landowners and the residents were based around sedimentation and degradation of the waterways and obviously you know you've got the two um, freshwater improvement funds that have come through and MPI and uh, Ministry for the Environment have been very, very proactive in the Marlborough area in terms of, um, I mentioned, you know, 7.5 million was was um, being given across the, the top of the south, but we had to apply for that. We had to be very specific about what we wanted to do. So we knew, um, going back to Elliot's thing about, you know, what do people want? We knew that there were a, a broad range of things that people wanted, but we were enabled through MFE and MPI um, to have a, a, an ability to engage Morpham. And Morpham came down and they're an environmental sort of engagement group. They came down into the entire catchment area and held nighttime meetings so that, you know, if the farmers were milking during the day or calving or whatever, that they could generally get to those meetings. And rather than do surveys, we had face-to-face -face meetings and there were thousands and thousands of um, little sticky notes put on, on walls saying, what was the catchment like when you first came here? Were you a child when you grew, you know, did you grow up in this catchment? Have you noticed changes? What's good, what's bad? What is sustainable, what isn't? How are the NPSs and NESs that are coming down from central government affecting you? And what can we do about it? And there were untold meetings and some of the meetings you felt like, you know, there wasn't really much progress being um, gained, but at the end of the day, Morpham enabled an indicative um, catchment enhancement program strategy, which uh, also looked at all the risk and risk management within that ca um, catchment. And the two uh, biggest risks that we initially found, were, or they're still there actually, is um, the sustainability of funding and and the community buy-in. And the community buy-in has been um, enabled in our catchment through continued meetings with the farmers. And we've got facilitators who 
in, in most cases, I think, are actually farmers. So they work in sub-catchments within the catchment and they go out and they have, uh, we have workshops, we, we have a steering group where a lot of those farmers come in and they can engage and, and learn about different bits and pieces. But we're also um, particularly aware of the, uh, yeah, some of the unrealistic expectations that are coming down, unfortunately, from central government through some of these NESs and MPSs. And, and if our council environmental staff can actively engage in pushing back against some of those, um, those regulations and rules, then they are gaining more confidence from within the community. So that's that's been really helpful. And we've got a catchment care coordinator who can go out and he actually literally walks into the farms, has a chat. There are still um, two or three farmers in particular in one of the, the larger areas of the catchment who are definitely very um, reluctant to join. But I think what is going to happen, which is what's happened in other areas, is that they will see that it's happening over their boundary fence and they'll want a piece of that pie. So it's it's actually quite a um, productive and positive way of doing things. But yeah, it definitely helps to have people who are resident within the catchment who are those who are you know going out facilitating these meetings. Yeah, thanks, Barbara. That's a really good point. It sort of morphed away, but also into that engagement, both of people that have been around for a while and perhaps those that have not ever really yet been engaged. Um, I think that's a pretty big, I think it's a pretty big um, topic, that one, and it would be great to hear the panellists' views on that because at the end of the day, without engagement, you're only going to get a few people trying to do the work. They'll burn out. The whole thing will fall over. So it uh, seems to me a big um, a big part of the success of these groups is, is the engagement. And I think uh, so much so, I think all five panellists should have a crack at this one. But, um, you know, how do you go about that sort of um, keeping keeping people engaged and engaging those who are not yet engaged and engaging those who are wondering what all the fuss is about and just hoping it'll go away, I guess. But um, maybe, could, should we perhaps start with um, Jane on that one? Haven't heard from Jane for a bit. What's your thoughts, Jane? Um, thank you. I, I guess we've we've discovered a myriad of ways, as we all have, all panellists would have, um, in terms of the way, I guess, that the adult um, and a way of learning. So as you know, adult, all adults and children have different ways of learning. And because we're doing a lot of work with in space with schools, um, the kids are the actually, they're, they're the easy ones to engage with because it's, uh, you know, there's pretty good rules that will not, I guess, um, mantra or um, ethos or knowledge around how to um, engage with children and how to um, help educate them and um, uh, and get them very involved. Now adults are the tricky ones and farmers are even more tricky in terms of a, uh, a difficult species to sort of you can't be generic about the way that they learn. So anyway we've found, found that a combination um, of ways so uh, small groups to workshops to um, large workshops, to on-farm. So um, those people that are, are more tangible learners get them out on farm. Some, in some ways, um, the farming industry is, is almost awash with um, things like workshops and um, on-farm field days. So what we found um, is a lot of farmers that are at the, you know, that, that other end of the bell-shaped curve that we're really trying to engage with, um, we're quite intimidated by going to um, either a sort of a hands-on workshop or a big field day. So what we found is um, using our sub-catchment groups, our pod groups, we call them, um, and really engaging, uh, looking at one, uh, it could, couldn't be, it might not be an issue, as the embassy before, it might be not so much an issue, it might be an opportunity. So an opportunity, for example, um, to be looking at um, some riparian planting or sediment traps on one person's farm that will make a difference to that entire catchment. So really focusing on a, a sort of a partnership and getting them engaged in that. I think if we say, okay, we're coming to everybody's farm um, next week to look at what you're, you're doing, I mean, that's really, really intimidating. So actually taking the focus off individual farmers, but um, utilising the, uh, I guess, saying that, that we have, um, and I'm sure you're all buy into this, um, is taking individual responsibility to make a collective difference. And, and even people that are a little bit intimidated in terms of the rules and regulations and the science behind a lot of these things, and lack of science in some regards too, um, 
working as a team in a collaborative manner to make your catchment um, uh, area and a pod group better has worked really, really well, even those people that don't want to engage. So I guess in a, in a nutshell, we're looking at a whole different, a uh, whole number of different ways of engagement with people. At times that has been one-on-one, -on -one, and I know that's not very cost or time effective, but actually for some people that one-on-one -on -one, one or two meetings like that has been enough, uh, given them enough confidence to then join uh, their pod group and join a bigger workshop and actually ask questions. So the biggest thing for us is, is uh, underlying and, and enhancing confidence because it, that does, confidence doesn't mean you know you know everything, but confidence gives you the confidence to ask questions. So oh, look, yeah, well put. Well put um, you yeah, know. that's that's probably the. Yep, excellent, very well put. And it just dawned on me how, you know, you're quite right. You throw a big field day, and that would be intimidating for people who are not normally involved with field days or, you know, perhaps they've felt a little bit behind the eight ball. And, um, yeah, you, easy to make them uncomfortable. So that's a great solution, really, about going back into a small on-farm, uh, even to the point of one-on-one -on -one workshops. So, yeah, great, great news. Right, our other panellists, who's next? Any hands up? Um, uh, Elliot first, please, and then Emma. Yeah, I think what Jane said was bang on, and it's about casting a wide net. Um, and some people do really engage with these workshop hands-on days, and there's a lot of great community bonding and things that happen then. Other people are, are, are totally adverse to those social events. So going onto their property, looking at what they're doing, um, sometimes people just want to show you what they're doing. Other times they want advice. Um, and then just providing online resources as well. Um, we've built with New Zealand Landcare Trust a really um, quite a comprehensive web page with uh, online workshops. This will probably end up there. Um, resources, uh, podcasts, all sorts of things that people can go in and access information when they want it. Um, maps and, and, and there's all sorts of things on there from, from soil to water quality to planting techniques etc so yeah so yeah so addressing the need yeah that's very good so addressing the needs of of individuals um very good emma yeah um just follow everyone else's um probably know quite a lot of it but like that low-hanging fruit like start with the low-hanging fruit um mm -hmm. and then build them into your trusted intermediaries and then when you've got those trusted intermediaries which are often people that others look to within the community and they say oh we're doing this and allow those other trusted people to tell your story because you can't tell people what they should be doing um uh, the other one is like um when we built our work program for the um, TR Community Tata project, we um, had a real clear focus on um, following on from building that strategy to allow room within or within all the objectives of our funded project for everyone to actually come in and take ownership over a small part. So they're really broad and basically they could be interpreted in many different ways. And um, it's up like it's it's open for people to come in and actually say, oh yeah, I can do that. That fits under that objective and the money's right there. Um, another one is like we're multi-stakeholder like we're um, Fish and Game Go Department of Conservation and we work quite closely alongside the Te Mana O Taere Na'awa project and so um, it's also allowing room for them to take ownership over something as well and um, it's all those different ways of engaging right like some people will get online and like love jumping into a jam board and other people are like no way and it's just finding finding your groove within that space excellent oh there's some um gems in there too thank you thanks for that emma um i think to um be good to hear from both ben and barbara relating to that mm -hmm. so ben first please um yeah so i think um Jane and Emma have, have touched on most things. I mean, our model is a little bit different in that we are very much about the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, our funding has, has allowed us to put um, our catchment farm advisors on the road. And we did a, a fair bit of, I guess, research and scoping leading up into that. And that's the feedback we got overwhelmingly from farmers in our catchment, that they wanted a, a person, a contact they knew they could ring or would sit down with them and work through these things. They, the the catch, uh, the the workshop model wasn't their preference at all. Um, and so we do run workshops for things, um, 
common interest, etc. But the primary contact is with one of our CFAs, and it's a person the farmer trusts. And I think that's we talk about engagement, so obviously probably goes without saying. But that trust between the the group and the farmers is is paramount, obviously. And it we we operate and live live on that. And if we if we lose that, then it doesn't matter what we do. Um, we 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 won't we won't get engagement at all. So. Um, that's that's probably where we, we've uh, that's our predominant um, way of engagement. Um, okay, sounds good. So just um, as but just before we head to Barbara, I just want to can build on that a little bit. Ben, um, you got any ideas or tips or, or thoughts around building trust? I mean, how, how do you sort of yeah, you know, so we you do or don't uh, you, you build trust over time. I think it starts one with the leadership, the people involved at the top, um, their standing in the community. That goes a long way. Um, we come in a, our area has a very low trust in its, um, or traditionally had a very low trust in, in the council. So how we treat people's information, we're very transparent and open with how what we're going to information we, we have of our members, how we treat it, how it's stored, who we will share it with and who we won't share it with. Um, so those things and just being yeah being straight up and transparent i think is is, is how you do it yeah be genuine about it i think that whole um idea of data uh, and the sensitivity around capturing data is another topic that will come up in a minute but thanks for raising that one um barbara thoughts on um engagement and ongoing basis yeah, uh, look, it's really interesting listening to everyone because I think at the end of the day, what is very evident is that there is no one size fits all, that you've got to have, you know, individuals on the ground one on one, but you've also um, got to allow for those who actually feel more comfortable in a group environment. And, you know, that's certainly exactly what we're doing. But what I've noticed, you know, that trust thing, it goes back again to everybody's impression is that when they're, they're told by a compliance officer that, you know, um, they've degraded a river or a stream or something like that, that it's council's fault. So therefore there is that level of distrust and, and actually hatred in some cases towards council when in actual fact council was fulfilling the role and the statutory requirements that is passed down to those local governments um, from central government. So you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. So, um, what we're also looking at, and which I've heard several of the other panellists talk about, is that engagement with schools. And if you get the children early and you um, impress on them the importance of maintaining their physical space and having a pride in their physical space and their environment, um, it tends to rub off on mum and dad at home. Um, in the Rye Valley area, just as an, an example, there's a lot of kids up there doing smack testing in the in the local streams and, and the river. And that's something that's been really interesting for them um, because they can see whether there is a direct change in the river, you know, after a flood event or if there's been sedimentation or something from forestry further up the stream. So um, the schools are noted by us as being quite key targets. And, and that sounds really quite blunt, but they are. And one of the other things that we've been engaging with is particularly in the link water catchment where I live is um, getting the kids out when we do dung beetle releases and the kids are fascinated by them. And quite frankly, most of the adults are as well um, because, you know, they can, they can actively see these um, little black beetles and, and they go, ooh, and ah, and ooh, that's disgusting and gross, but they love it. And they go home and talk to mum and dad and they talk about soil health and the improvement to the soil health and you know so they can move on from there and also there's the um, quick win project so um, you know there's there's a lot of trusted people within the actual catchment who are able to be out there and able to tell the story and are able to bring and encourage others into the group and that's exactly what's happening um, it hasn't been easy it's been a long slow haul but because we've had issues like the um, July storm that has uh, actually in some weird sort of way, shape or whatever to allow us to engage a little bit more with those in the catchment. Mm, um, no, I've got to, to excuse yeah. myself for one second. I've got someone in my office, but I will be back. Apologies. It's, it's a well-made point. And I think, um, you know, there's a number of fast food franchises around the world that have done very well by 
having kids drag mum and dad into the fast food franchise and there's no secret they're getting the message out through the kids and getting that um, enthusiasm uh, built from the ground up is, is important. It'll take a generation, obviously, if we if we solely rely on that. Uh, I'd also um, actually, I'll just come to, to, to Jane who may have a response to that as well. Jane, something like that? Oh, I just, I just thought of something too. In terms of engagement, there's a whole lot of levels of engagement. I think all of us think engagement is fully immersion in, in, in something, because that's how we, I guess we probably work in terms of our personalities. But to a lot of farmers, we 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 found a lot of farmers are actually just going to something and getting off the farm and thinking in that space and realizing all they might need to do on that day is realize, wow, I'm not the only one that doesn't understand this topic or isn't doing this. For example, uh, the mental health side. Don't ever underestimate the mental health side of 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 bringing people together. I guess, and I know that I'm preaching to the converted here. Um, and I guess one other thing in terms of engagement that we we'll probably will talk about later, I imagine, Tony, is how, uh, engagement of your volunteers and, and bringing them in at different levels in terms of what they're comfortable with, at as well, because not everyone uh, wants to necessarily be on the steering group or board or, or, or committee, um, but there are different, uh, so many different roles, and, and we went into it with quite a sort of a traditional model, and gosh, where we've ended up is so far away from that, because if we hadn't moved from a traditional committee type model, uh, we would still be um, only have the same three or four volunteers instead of, you know, 20, 30. So um, yeah, that's, that's, I won't take up any more time, but I just wanted to say that. Oh, look, it's, it's a very good point. Uh, again, very well made. And I think, you know, by allowing it to fall on a few willing volunteers at the start, the danger, of course, is that they burn out um, or that we have nobody to hand over to anyway, because sometimes it starts with a few people who didn't know how to say no. <laughs> Um, but if it's just built on that and not on true engagement, uh, it's not really a success. Uh, Emma, uh, response as well? Yeah, like um, just to follow on from Jane, because it was a really good point. Like, in, One thing I'd like to say is sometimes you've just got to give yourself a break because you're never going to get everybody. And um, and that's okay. And um, oh, what was I going to say? Yeah, that the whole, like, just have a barbecue, just get people on for a barbecue and get curious and listen. Like some people, sometimes all people want to do is talk, right? And that's really good because then something might pop out of that conversation that you really hadn't thought of. Um, yeah. No, it's, a, it's a great point. I just wanted to, because um, it just seems if I was listening, I'd hear that it's a lot about um, farmers and a, and a few others, but of course our catchments have a whole range of um, operations going on in them and not only from privately held landowners but also quite big um, uh, organisations within our communities and catchments as well so just be really keen to sort of tap into that because I know some groups have done a really good job of engaging with you know big organisations and whether they be you know forestry for example or, or others that may seem to be the enemy but equally they may be very helpful so I'm just really interested in, in a few thoughts on that because I know that there's um I know people are interested in that one. Anybody got anything they'd like to add to that sort of, how do you engage big guys? Do you wait for them to come in? Do you had any success in, uh, approaching them right early on? Or Tony, we're, um, we're going out and one of the key issues that we've had in, in our catchment is around the forestry and the sedimentation or the perceived sedimentation coming from the forestry because we actually now have studies and monitoring that shows that you know the forestry is not the not the big evil that it was thought to be however there is room for improvement very definitely um, so we've gone out and we've approached um, there is one main forestry company within the Tehuiri catchment but we've gone out and approached the other ones as well and we're just in the process now of actually having a sit down with all of them and there is a, a, a keenness which is really positive to see around research and what we can do to um, improve the catchment as a whole but what they can do within their forests that might help the catchment as a whole which I think is really positive. Um, can I just touch on one other thing as well that whole mental health thing um, that I think Emma talked about before it, it is so important and it is one of the ways that we actually connect and certainly as a counsellor within the catchment um, you know you pick up on problems because people ring you at 10 o'clock at night and say I've got an issue or I'm not happy with this. And generally speaking, it is something that is related back to the land or their particular um, you know, area of interest. And in a lot of cases, it is something that we as catchment care um, 
uh, people can actually help out with. So um, that's that's been quite key in that we are making it known through newsletters and um, posters and daytime engagements with local communities and resident associations that there are these people that are out and about and can be contacted if need be. Um, and we're certainly very open to that. So yeah, it's um, it's a long haul, but yeah, never never underestimate that that whole mental health thing because it's pretty key at the moment. People have been through a really hard time, and some of them, you know, might not necessarily see um, improving their waterway as being a priority. They might see their priority as getting food on the table. And um, just going to jump in there. Sorry, like acknowledging the challenge with. Um, mm virtual communications like when you have a virtual meeting you can't go to the pub afterwards and have a beer and just relax and chill out and and just looking back and just acknowledging that that's a challenge and that's okay and it will come right um and engagement is really hard like um i love um the maori proverb kanohi kite kanohi and being able to sit sit together face to face and actually feel what the other person is thinking rather than just talking like this through a screen right because we can't go and have a coffee afterwards and that actually really sucks again very well made point thank you emma you have also raised another topic really uh, and it's a it's a big topic in its in itself but it's really around engagement with the whole community uh with iwi and, and in particular those who have an interest um be it direct or indirect um just wondering really interested in, in seeing how we go about that i know our friends in the north island have have really got some good ideas on it and this morning um the, the webinar covered some of that so we could learn a lot from them but really interested in what the panelists um, approach to, to that may be and um, perhaps Elliot is maybe something you can kick us off with. So are you asking about engaging the community now rather than the big organisations? Oh sorry yeah more directly with iwi as well and more um, perhaps wider than just simply those who are currently working on the land and living immediately in the area but an iwi kind of engagement as well. Yeah so um, in the top of the South Island that is something that we do have um, a little bit of trouble with due to the capacity of iwi and the demand that has been placed upon them. So we have struggled to have the level of engagement that we would like to have. Um, we do a little bit of work as a, as a trust um, around that. Uh, but in terms of our iwi engagement, that's been with one of the larger corporate bodies, Wakatu Incorporated. And um, and then what we're saying to go back to the question before about the engaging the, the corporates is we, we're seeing, well, the, the larger organizations, we're seeing um, people in management roles that are, are really keen to take on a pet project, uh, but they may not have the budget in their budgets to work with. Um, we're seeing some of the large um, horticultural entities being brought up by people like the super fund. Um, so they're working with limited budgets, but there's guys there at the management level that are really keen to do some good environmental work and so helping them in the door um we're hoping that their budget will be extended and that work will continue and um yeah wakatu has been one of those in our area they've used a group of trainees from their one of their horticultural blocks and they've been training them how to plant and uh, do plant maintenance within the riparian fenced areas on their properties. Mm, sounds good. Hey, so you just made a comment about you, you know, struggle to get the level of iwi engagement that you'd hoped for. So when you say you hoped for, had that come from your surveys and things or where? Uh, yes, and, and it's also um, part of the funding agreement with MPI and, and there, is a, there is a budget aspect to that as well um, for, for engagement. Um, we have quite, a, a, I guess, a low uh, population of iwi at the top of the south. So finding uh, suitably qualified people with the capacity to provide oversight. So sort of, um, uh, you know, um, high level views on restoration and, 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 and um, um, toanga species and, and these sort of things and how you might approach that. Um, it, yeah, it's been a challenge to find people available to provide those sort of engagement activities. 
Okay. But, so what I'm hearing though is that you've been encouraged to do that by the nature of the funding and, and the proposal that you put to MPI. So it's helpful on one hand, but equally it's challenging in that if, if they're not resourced usefully engaged, then it's probably, yes, probably hard on them as well. I think all the panelists have a chance for this one. Um, ben, what's your thoughts around that? Do you have much you'd like to add in regards to that? Um, yeah, so it's, it's a really um, good point. Um, and so we have two Runanga in, our, um, in the area that we, we're, we're working in. And um, they, they're both uh, stretched for capacity. You know, they're, they're um, been approached more and more by many different groups uh, for their approval, for their input um, currently. So th that's the reality that we're, we're working with. Um, so we've we've um, got you know quite some way some way with one one runanga and we've been to the marae and we've sat down with them and talked about what we're doing and we have a good relationship there um, with the other. It's still we've we've uh, communicate with them, sent them letters. We keep them up to date with what we're doing, what we're thinking, and why. Um, but we haven't had an opportunity to sit down and talk. Um, and so we'll just keep up with that information. Um, my what I've picked up um, is that in this, I guess my experience in the last few years is the Runanga don't like you turning up looking for a rubber stamp. In other words, if you're thinking you've got it all sorted and you turn up just to want their approval and carry on, that will probably get looked at in a very, um, you know, in a not a very positive light, and you might find yourself waiting for a very long time to get anywhere. So it's really important to try and communicate from day one, um, even if you don't feel you get much response, because that will count for a lot, I, I think. Um, and just keep that communication up, um, even if you're not getting a lot back, it will be appreciated. Um, and if you can have a, a form a, a friendship relationship, professional relationship, or um, get to know a member of the Runanga yourself and just sit down and have a chat um, informally, that will probably do as much or more good as a whole lot of meetings. Um, and so just use whatever opportunities you have uh, to start the conversation. And it takes time to build that trust. Um, and that's become really obvious too in other people I've talked to. You don't get what you want or you don't get to a, a it takes time to build that relationship. So look at it as a long term um, part of, of your group and um, I think you'll get there. Yeah, gee, there's some great insights in there. Thank you very much, Ben. That was good. Um, Jane, down in the North Otago area, what's your approach? Yeah, look, I just echo um, those words from the previous panelists. Um, you know, resources are very stretched for our local iwi. And I, I guess um, uh, we try to keep them informed as much as we can without bogging them down with coming to all of our meetings. So if there's key um, key areas um, that we really want them to be, well, that they would like to be involved in, um, and particularly on the tangible side of things. So we, whenever we do any of our riparian plantings, um, we talk about uh, all the layers or all the things that need to be um, uh, encompassed in that one planting. So it used to be that we, when we first started, we'd plant plants just for the sake of it. And now they've got to be in critical source areas. They've got to be have some form of public access or public viewability, if you like. Um, they've got to be literally helping with obviously water, um, waterways and biodiversity. And um, ideally, um, also involve uh, local iwi and, and you know that's not just that in terms of a tick box because it's you know it needs to be genuine engagement but those things that I mentioned in terms of the biodiversity and um, and uh, waterways and, and genuinely make genuinely making a difference um, they will be involved in that anyway so it's not it's not a tick box as I said as I listed those things they are mm -hmm. all interactive uh, interacted um, and um, so it's, it's certainly a challenge. Um, and look, everyone's pressured on time and everyone's pressured on resources. And I think the biggest thing is keeping that communication up. And again, I think the most effective way we have found that is working with, with schools. And um, a, a big key moment for me that we discussed at NOSDAM recently was um, 
I was in our local town, Amaru, and I overheard, get this, some children that I don't even know, I don't even know what school they go to, talking about Noslam. And I thought, oh, that's, you know, it wasn't just my children or someone that I've talked to at a workshop. They were actually talking about it because they were talking about um, a program that we've been running called Soil Your Undies um, in terms of soil um, quality and um, breaking down um, uh, and, and soil by, by, uh, biodiversity and, and how that is enhanced by good soil structure. Anyway, the point is um, engaging with a younger um that the younger generation has helped us engage with everybody, be it iwi, be it um, uh, urban people, be it other landowners that we may not get to through general, uh, normal sort of farming channels. So, um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. Um, Emma, down your way, what's, what's your thoughts? Yeah, um, iwi are incredibly under-resourced and um, it's always been conscious of that, like everyone else has said, but we've got two um, local runanga, which is Pukatoraki and um, Otako, and the the privilege we have had is that we work alongside the Tamana o Taiwi Na Awa project, which is a dock um, partnership between um, Mana Whenua, um Department of Conservation and the Otago Regional Council and that has allowed us to um, actually host um, Renanga in the catchment and through um, two, three, three hui's um, over the past sort of 12 to 15 months and um, just that face-to-face -face, um, interaction is like, like it, we're really spoiled with the Na'awa project being right there and don't share values right like the amazing um, it's been it's been a real treat Mm, good, thanks for that. Um, and just while um, Barbara's collecting her thoughts on that one, I do know that some of the councils have um, you know, made formal uh, efforts in order to try and have people with a responsibility to engage with the communities um, from, from an EWI perspective. So various cultural land advisors and other, they may go by other names and other councils, but I know that, um, oh, as well as down to the individuals involved, but building that trust at a one-on-one at a -on -one level, very important. How about up in the top of the South Island, Barbara? Yeah, look, you're absolutely right, Tony. And um, yeah, capacity, that's the word that's used to us or with, with us so many times. And we're very, very lucky in that Ngāti Kuia are extremely connected and collaborate with us hugely. Rangatane um, are lacking in capacity. They've, they've just um, employed someone from uh, X141 Forestry um, who has gone over to be their, their sort of environmental manager and advisor, which is fantastic. But um, yeah, the Ngāti Kuia um, have put in a native nursery at Te Huiri at Pelorus Bridge. And so that's been part and parcel of the catchment program, which is really positive. And I was talking to the chair of Ngāti Kuia yesterday and we have a really good relationship and, and you know, all credit to him for the engagement that, that we are allowed through Marlborough District Council, quite frankly, and through the project. Um, but he said to me, you know, it's fantastic to go in there and see from, you know, what was the start of the native nursery to these young people now who had previously been unemployable and are now learning these skills and they're active within the community. They are, you know, growing these, these plants from seed that's been sourced within the catchment. They're planting out the seedlings, they're maintaining, weeding around the seedlings, watering them, making sure that they're essentially like their little babies. So they're, you know, they're really engaged and that's been something that's very, very positive for them. Uh -huh. um, but the other thing that we're doing uh, this month actually is holding a Te Reo workshop um, at Tahora Marae. And, you know, that in itself will enable people within the community and particularly, um, the likes of myself on the governance group, the steering group members to become aware of what is particularly culturally important for Ngāti Kuia in particular uh, within the catchment, but also to learn you know, a bit more about their culture, their language, um, and to ensure that we're not bumbling and fumbling our ways through, through meetings. Um, as we, if you're a certain age like myself, you know, I wasn't offered te reo when I went to school. And so I'm now having to sort of learn bits and pieces. So for those of you who already know some, I think you're, you know, in, in a, um, a unique uh, position to be able to engage properly with iwi um, when you have those particular meetings. But yeah, look, the capacity and the demand 
is a huge issue at the moment and I'm not sure how we get around that other than to encourage um, young people to to do the relevant courses at university but uh, it was quite heartening the other day to see that all the top of the south um, councils had actually committed to um, to granting I think it's about thirty thousand dollars each council towards um, the Tayo, the the environment, the the iwi cultural environment um, position. So mm. that's a start. Look, yeah, look, I, I think you make a very good point. And um, I was just on a chat earlier prior to this call, actually, and we discussed pretty much this: how do we how do we actually help resource that engagement? Because we we do we acknowledge we want to engage with iwi. We don't really know how. We, we're trying our best, but equally, if they're under resourced to do it. Uh, it's going to be challenging. So I think, um, you know, there's some real opportunities there. Um, look, I, I'm conscious of the time. We're sort of starting to get close to when we promised we would um, wrap up. And I'd like to have a wee bit of a chat about succession coming up. But just, and as much as I'd love to see you guys all again in five years' time, I kind of hope that it's, uh, you know, you've got a succession plan in place so that you've got the people coming through as well. But So you can give that a bit of thought. But in the meantime, Denise, is there any other questions that have really... Um, that I haven't been able to glance at on the chat that we'd like to perhaps address uh, as well. So um, I'll kick off our panellists with just a bit of a, a question around this idea of succession planning, but maybe if you can um, perhaps prompt another one or two, um, if you can see them there, Denise. So um, my idea really is that, um, yes, as much as we've loved engaging with our five panellists today, wouldn't it be cool if each of them had something in place behind them so that um, somebody else can carry on the, the good work? So. Um, whether you've given it much thought or not, um, really be interested to see if you've got any ideas and, and things about um, about that particular topic. So how about we start with, uh, we'll start at the top, how about Elliot, what do you think? What did you know about that idea? Yeah, um, so from a, personally, I'm about halfway through my contract in delivering this, this funded project. And so in terms of real planning, I haven't had the time to get there because it's been a lot of balls in the air just to deliver um, the, the funding. Okay, so what, what I'll do then, I'll challenge you on that one and say, it's not just about a project funding. Let's let's try and look wider than the catchment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's right. I'm, I'm getting there. Excellent, so, all right. <laughs> the, 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 the plan is to um, to really develop this in, in, in the la later stages of, of, of my time. But I think that this will happen around a couple of central resources that have been generated in the meantime. So we're on to four community nurseries now. We've got three up and running and we've got a fourth one coming online. Three of those are at um, primary schools and one of those is at, at, at an ad, adult education centre. So the, the adult in education centre is quite a good hub. Um, and we've also got larger restoration projects that will need a lot of ongoing attention and they will become a community resource. So um, in terms of how we um, resource that with, with man hours, um, ideally it would there would be some funding to, to pay somebody for some time um, ongoing. Uh, otherwise we'd be looking to the community for, for, for volunteering, for, for doing funding applications and organizing volunteer days, et cetera. Um, for the next 18 months, we, we, we are resourced in that and, um, and the planning will happen. Okay, so it's kind of succession beyond the project. And these nurseries, do they have a, a part in that more, more than just producing plants? Are they like a, com a commercial entity or a non-for-profit or how are they set up? Uh, at the moment, they're set up to, to supply the funded project with... Right. Um, with slightly cheaper plants and provide a resource as an education centre for the for the schools or the wider community, but they need to have a um, a, li a long life plan um, mm. in order to maintain them to ensure that they have uh, a, a place for their plants to go every year and they have income to cover their costs and um, and knowledge hopefully that's being built and staying within those spaces around plant mm. propagation. Yeah, um, good point. So good. that's a, that's something we really do need to put a lot of focus into. We haven't quite got the solution as yet, but there's a lot of people within the community that have, have a high awareness of uh, these community nurseries and the and the need to keep them running as a resource for the community, both for plants and as a social aspect as well. So great way to do it. It's a great way to get that succession 
in place, um, have a, something that lives on beyond the project. Um, just conscious of the time, just a quick few thoughts from each of our panelists on that one. Barbara, what's your thoughts around succession? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I was just thinking um, it's ironic that we used to have all these skills and we're having to go back to retraining our communities to, to you know, learn how to grow plants again, which is kind of sad, really. But, yeah, look, we've, we hope that we've tied everything down by um, the trust that we have created and the trust deed itself, but also a memorandum of understanding. So there's always been that, that um, recognition of the risk and losing that community engagement and, and the sustainability of funding going forward. So with the trust deed that we have, we know that we'll have to go out at some point and ask again for extra funding, but in terms of the training and the educational um, facilitators and things like that that we've got within the catchment, we believe that that will set us up um, to a good extent. But, um, you know, the aim always was to have a healthy, happy, resilient um, economically sound and balanced community and catchment with um, fresh water that we could drink again and um, you know just um, everything aligned and we're hoping that we've got everything right it has taken us a while that trustee getting that signed took us two years over two years and admittedly COVID has been in between so that's interrupted some of the process there but we've put in place a system so that there will always be a project manager, um, hopefully, um, whether that's based within council or a, an independent one, um, not sure. But yeah, our project manager, um, like Elliot, has been absolutely key and fantastic and has identified, um, you know, this, this key need for resilience and sustainability. So we're pretty onto that, I hope. Sounds good. Might have actually missed that earlier, so the distinction between governance and and, and hands on with the project. So you're more of a governance role. So you've got succession, yep. I guess, in both both parts of that, both in terms of governance yes. um, and in terms of on the, on the ground as well. Yeah, um, absolutely right. So we've, we've got a, a layer of governance in a layer of a steering committee. And then underneath that, we've got all our facilitators and, and the, you know, the council staff and the catchment care facilita um, facilitators and coordinators. Very good, yes. Ben, thoughts around that? And so this is succession beyond the funding of a project. Okay, that's really relevant. Um, we are in halfway through our current sort of round of funding um, and that's very much our focus at the moment. Um, so for us, it really starts with almost what you call a business plan. What's the value proposition for our members? What do they, the services that we provide that they really value? and um, how can we continue that, that level of service into the future? Once we've defined that, then um, we've got, we are prepared to apply for more funding because that's one thing we have learned is that funding opportunities come and go quite quickly. And if you don't have your ducks in a row, um, then it's very, very difficult to get them all lined up and get a good application in, in the time periods that you often get. So. We need to be prepared. Um, we've always run a subscription model. So um, we do have a level of funding coming in from our members. And so we, we look at this point, we look at a range of scenarios. One, what can we do purely on a subscription model if we're not successful in getting funding? And um, secondly, be prepared for uh, to put applications in when, um, when they become, become available. Yeah, that's a very good point. So just being aware of what's on the horizon there and making sure you guys are ready for it. Good point. Um, now to one of the busier people we know, Jane, your thoughts around succession. Are you going to be here in five years' time or you do? <laughs> um, hope, well, I still want to be involved, but on a farmer, landowner level probably. But um, we've been, I mentioned it before and you probably can't see it very well, but we've basically got, no, you won't be able to. We've got four pillars. Of activity and one of them as I said and I hate to go on about this is future proofing. Um, now when we talk about future proofing and I mentioned it before we talk about um, three different areas well it's actually four but one is our activity are we going to be you know in terms of relevance uh, what's next uh, what's the next two years five years ten years who would have thought ten years ago that we would be talking about things maybe now that we are talking about um, it's moved 
beyond um, water quality to a lot of other things in terms of alternate crops, et cetera, and um, emissions, et cetera. So really looking at our activity. Um, and when I say that, I'm talking about bread and butter activity rather than projects. Um, looking at our people. Now, I mentioned before the, the people thing. Um, and again, we used to have, a, and I mentioned it also before, a sort of a federated farmers type of model that you basically, it was, it was uh, you're on the committee and it was all about longevity and you went from, you know, a committee member to the vice, to the, to the chair, et cetera completely turned that around and realized actually people that want to be involved won't necessarily want to sit in our steering committee and that is our that that is our governance we don't have another layer that is our governance um and and as soon as we realized that it was a real aha moment and we said gosh we've got all these great people and a lot of younger people that didn't want to have the you know the formality around uh you know agms or being a secretary or treasurer etc but wanted to be really engaged in making a difference um and so they've come to us and said uh, I'd love to be a pod group leader. And so that's how we've really, um, all the number of pods that we have now um, under the NOSAM umbrella are huge simply because they've been driven by farmers on the ground saying, hey, here's an opportunity or a problem. Can I drive that in my um, sub catchment group? So some people are happy to be doing that. Some want, some are really driven by the governance level. Some want to come in as sort of a um, more on, on a technical side of things, help run workshops, et cetera. So it's, I guess it's courses for courses or, or what's everyone's passion project um, and what would they like to be involved in. And even on our steering group who are in charge of those four pillars that I talked about, some of us um, are involved in, for example, I'm, the, I'm involved in the future proofing and um, the connectivity. Um, there's, there's other people that are involved really focusing on the on-farm change and some that are involved in the science and projects so that's not to say we're not all over those things but in terms of responsibility um, that's what we're we are um, indeed doing and I know um, I'm trying to think I think Barbara mentioned before about um, having some really good systems in place in terms of the, the legal structure um, what we did right from the start was we we've got uh, remembering that we had no project funding this is back when uh, catchment groups were you know not not really a thing in fact I just to just to go back a wee but I remember someone saying to me um, 10 years ago oh no catchment groups no that'll never fly that's a 1980s 1990s model never you know that's not going to work um, so what we did uh, we went to we, we, our baseline funding as I said and it's not a huge amount it's less than $30,000 a year um, is from from local uh, um, we've got a, a corporate um, irrigation so an irrigation company um, and we also have a partner a corporate partner so that's an accountancy firm that helps us with all of our uh, sort of our day-to-day um, -day admin um, and our structure etc and once we had that nailed um, that's a huge worry for new for new catchment groups starting up if they can't go under someone else's umbrella because just the as you know legality around the banking and it's just a, it's a total nightmare so because that is set up we can really help other other catchment groups, if they wanted to come under our umbrella, um, we can really help help them do that. That was the key thing. The final thing was the funding. So life beyond um, projects, and we've mentioned that before, and, and that is crucial. So I go on about this a lot, but I'm fiercely protective of our baseline funding, and I mean fiercely protective. So um, without that, we would not be doing what we do, and we would only be, a, you know, again, as hot as our projects that we are doing. And our projects, again, are, are small compared to those ones that have been mentioned today, but um, they certainly sit... In a place but it is not a place that is necessarily in our baseline activity um, because we feel that it's really important that we can still carry that on no matter how much uh, funding comes and goes we need to so so securing in that long-term funding with those partners so um, with our local district council for example um, and making sure that we're not just going to them hand on you know cap in hand every year please sir can I have some more um, because actually it's really, really important that we, um, it's a partnership. So that's right What from the start, we've called that a partnership and it is indeed that. Um, and we've got KPIs that we have to adhere to, of course, but we have been very, very clear to those funders that we are very, very strong on 90% activity, 10% reporting at the most. So innovation heavy, admin light, because we are not prepared with the, the you know, it doesn't matter how, the amount of money you're, you're looking at on a percentage basis, we did not want to um, be spending too more time reporting on what we're doing than actually um, doing doing what we want to do. So um, 
And also, I guess, having the flexibility, that's the other thing. And, and I guess it is one thing that concerns me a lot greatly is the lack of flexibility around some of this funding, um, uh, particularly the Crown funding. Um, and I think um, that is a real concern because, um, and, and we've seen a touch of that, you know, when we've decided we could do something cheaper, better, faster, um, that you you know you, you're basically stuck in this a, a bit of a railway so um, line that you may have decided two years ago was the way to go but maybe it isn't now so I think that uh, you know if I was going to feed something back to uh, MPI and MFE etc I'd be saying actually sometimes the most innovative way to do it it may be quite different to what you initially applied for so um, making sure so in terms of um, succession just making sure that we're not burning people out and I think Tony or someone mentioned that before that's really key as well and I think one thing that we've come up against um, and that's really driven us to create a lot of resources around this on our website um, is uh, we are spending a lot of time at the moment um, telling our story, and this is great. Like, this is great. There's no no offence to anyone today, um, but you know we spend our volunteers are spending so much time. Like, I was I think we probably get contacted at least twice a week by different organisations or regional councils or saying how do you do what you do. Look, we are really happy to share that, but gosh, it is a, it's it's you know it's really the demand on the time, um, particularly for our volunteers, but also our coordinators is huge. Um, so just to try to be a bit more efficient, for example, we put together, a, and it was just a little cheap video with some local people, I think it cost $500, we got our steering group together and said, right, if we were starting again, what advice would we give um, a catchment group? And so that's on our website, and I know it's not the same as having someone coming and speaking to you personally, but um, you know, we were traveling all around, uh, particularly, well, the South Island really, but um, trying to tell our story to help other people, and I don't regret that for a moment, but um, again, we took our focus off um, our baseline activity. So again, it's just sometimes you need to be called out on that a little bit to refocus in terms of um, what's important. So I think we can do both, but I think uh, councils particularly need to be respectful of uh, voluntary time and, and making sure, um, yeah, that, that they, they, they ask those questions and we share information like we're doing today, but in a, in a really efficient manner. Brilliant. Look, that's, again, well said, and, and the idea of actually getting on and doing, as opposed to admin and reporting on it, getting that balance right, nine to ten sounds like a pretty good, a pretty good target to me. And 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 again, another great lesson in there is that you know success. I guess one of the unintended consequences of it um, is that everyone wants to know how you do what you do. So it's kind of a it's a bit of a pat on the back at the same time, but equally, um, yes, if it gets in the way of work getting done, um, equally it's. It, uh, one of the um, unintended consequences, I guess. Um, just on that thought on succession, um, Emma, do you have a chance to share some thoughts around that? Yeah, um, can you can you hear me? I got kicked off, <laughs> and so I'm back on my phone. But um, yeah, it, it is a real challenge, and like uh, this, I love working in the catching space, but it is something I don't want to do forever because at some stage you've got to actually do something that you do get paid for. Um, but it, it comes back to um, like those challenges around funding are real. And the amount of conversations I've had with people that are not just down here, but all over the country over the past probably year or so is that we need to find a way to do this better. And a lot of um, that funding is so important, right? But it's how do you take all the Jobs for Nature funding and pivot off that and actually create something that's going to be at the last beyond the five-year term? And that, that, is, that is a real challenge for us um, because the, um, the, and it, it comes down to that um, implementing that strategy and actually staying mindful of the fact that how do you use this money to make it a 300-year vision that matches up with a lot of the... Um, um, resonations with the mana whenua that we've um hui's that we've had in the catchment over the past um year or so but like um i'm actually wondering i'm sitting here thinking i wonder if Lincare trust can pick up on that and actually coordinate something in that space because um yeah we have um we, yeah i don't like i'd hate to break it down but we probably have someone pretty much full-time working on reporting and that's money that although we we need our funding but that money directly takes away from um, outcomes in our catchment and it's how do you yeah how do we build that a uh, better trusted relationship with MPI and MFE to actually um, improve that space and about getting um, more people into catchment groups it's 
it's leadership, right? It's, it's allowing um, that safe space that all opinions matter, um, curiosity, um, getting young people in there and, and they come up with ideas and nothing's a bad idea and just jumping in behind all those ideas and then you can actually bring people in and get them comfortable in that space. And if you get them comfortable in that space standing up, then that's, that's leadership, that's getting them, um, getting them involved. Mm, excellent. That's very good. Gee, it does lead on to some very, uh, very interesting little um, starters for Tina. And that one too, Emma. So with regards to funding and the flexibility around milestones and things, uh, I, know, I know from experience and from what I've heard from other people, there's quite a bit of um, flexibility in some, but not so much in others. Um, any sort of thoughts around how you go about something that might have been, seemed like quite a sort of strict set of milestones but but quite quickly became out of date and with the benefit of hindsight might ne never have been agreed to in the first place and I'm just wondering if um, maybe could share a few experiences on that one because I'm certainly aware a few a few folk have been caught up in that little cycle um, maybe um, who'd like to start with that one Ben yep I that? can um we've so we've obviously with our MPI funding um that situation has come up um probably a really good example and just one example is in our original funding was um, to deliver a certain number of overseer budgets and um, then with the issues with overseer it's become a lot less relevant but of what has become much more relevant is doing greenhouse gas um, numbers um, so we were just able to work with the MPI um, and through a contract variation change from delivering um, overseer budgets which were of less value to um, your sort of hill country dryland farmers to doing their GHG numbers and a plan on, on um, how to manage those. So that's one example. We've found that um, working with MPI in terms of making alterations to the details of what we deliver uh, it does take some time but it's quite doable in um, it's it, yeah, it's worked well. So um, I don't think be afraid of that. Just it's again, it's relationships and keeping that communication going. A great point and very uh, very relevant, tangible examples there. Um, Elliot, any thoughts around that? You've had to pivot on the way through, for lack of a better word. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a great example that we can I can speak to is uh, funding through the Provincial Development Unit uh, for 35 kilometres of riparian fencing. Um, the timeline when I started was about two and a half months or three months to, to finish that fencing, which yeah, all the fencing contractors and everybody obviously laughed at. Um, the Ministry was incredibly flexible. Uh, when I entered into, into the role, I didn't understand that. So um, having that that understanding actually allowed us to build over 50 kilometres of fencing and, and over 18 months. Um, simply, we just kept asking for a time extension and because we were overachieving and we were showing we were going to overachieve, they were quite flexible with that. Um, M MPI have been really good to deal with um, and there is flexibility around... Um, most things, I think, if there's reasonable justification, one of the biggest challenges I've found is that the fund managers regularly roll over. So the relationships that you develop and the trust-based relationship that you may have developed over the last couple of months disappears and you, you do need to start again. Um, so that is quite a big challenge. But generally, the people operating at the ministry, I think, uh, have a, quite a good level of understanding and, and can be quite pragmatic. Um, I probably in the early days tried to give more than I needed to reporting wise and I've learned to give less and if more is required it will be asked for because um, that you know that 90 10 um, number that was talked about yeah that would be great um, it's, you need to show what you're doing but we've got to limit how much time we spend talking about it and and, and how much time we are doing it is, is, is what's really important. Very good. Hey, that's a, a, a good learning, which I'm sure many uh, listening will take on board because it's very easy to want to over deliver in terms of reporting early on. But yeah, if you pair it back to the minimum with questions to be answered if required, great approach. Yeah. I'm sure plenty of yeah. folks would take something out of that. Thanks, Elliot. 
Um, anyone else like to add into that discussion? Barbara, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, look, we, we've had nothing but positive um, experiences, really. Um, the, the time frames in terms of applying for these grants has always caused a few issues because our staff, generally speaking, um, have been the council staff, so the environmental staff who've been the ones who've been writing up all the applications for things like Jobs for Nature or the freshwater funding. Um, but we found MFE and MPI um, staff have been incredibly flexible and actually very, very helpful and wanting to engage on the ground. So they've been coming to the majority of our meetings, our steering group meetings, not necessarily the, the governance, so always zoom into the governance meetings, but then they've stepped back from the governments once we've had the, um, the trust deed signed and they're happy just to come along um, every now and then to the steering group meetings. And that's been really positive because in a lot of instances, we haven't had the knowledge or the experience around certain quick win projects, and they've been able to suggest alternate ways or other options of either gaining funding or, or different ways of actually doing things, which has been great, because obviously, I mean, they've got the connections throughout New Zealand, so they're seeing how other catchment groups are, are doing things, and they're able to say, well, have you thought about doing it this way? Um, so, yeah, we've been very, very fortunate. Excellent. Good to hear. Um, I'll just add in there, um, we, with ours, um, it's building in a risk matrix, like an extensive risk matrix. Like if you think it's a possibility that it might become a risk, put it in the risk matrix because that makes your reporting a whole lot easier because you can just keep referring to your risk matrix because there are so many holdups at the moment, right? Like around being able to meet face to face, actually um, being able to get on farm, being um, fencing material supply issues and stuff like that, but it's all in the risk matrix. Very good. Excellent. Nice practical solution there, Emma. Um, Jane, any thoughts? Sorry, Sorry just unmuting. Um, look, I, I, you're a lot more experienced in, in, um, in terms of the project side of things, all of you, um, that, than I am. But I mean, I guess one thing that we um, have learned is to slow down and develop a plan before you action and before you apply for funding. Look, I know that's a little bit naive to say that when you see some of the deadlines when they're announced and, um, and when the closing is. But I guess we're always thinking, is this going to build on our on our baseline activity and our connectivity on farm change and making a difference? Or are we looking at that, that money and thinking, gosh, that sounds um, like a you know great headline or, or uh, yeah. So always checking that that is going to make a, a genuine difference. Um, and I congratulate you all on your projects. It certainly sounds like they are. Um, and um, I think everyone's um, you know become a lot more holistic in the way that we're looking at all of our catchments and how projects will fit into that. So thank you. Great comment. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sort of thinking now, just in terms of time, there's still a few topics that we could cover, but... I'd like to give now the opportunity to the panelists, maybe each, just to come up with a, something that you'd like to share with the others, something that perhaps hasn't been asked yet, or one of your own little, um, you know, kind of uh, key things that you learned uh, or battle scars you earned um, in, your, in, your, in the roles that you've got with your particular catchment. So um, as I do that, I'd also just like to start to get the audience thinking about what are the key things uh, they've learned from today as well, because at the end of the day, your own aha moments or the key things that you're either heard or have popped into your mind after hearing uh, what some of the speakers have have shared with us. Um, that's pretty important stuff too. So we'd like to try and capture that uh, on the chat box in a minute. So if you can sort of turn, turn your thoughts to what your key learnings are as you're just listening to the panelists now, perhaps come up with their own uh, their own uh, one final sort of parting shot, if you like, or, or one thing you'd like to really impress on the, on the rest of us. Um, Barbara, you're mainly on my screen at the moment. Well, perhaps we'll start with you. Anything you'd like to perhaps add to that? Yeah, well, just something that occurred to me is a project that we've just been doing recently is around the branding of our, our group, our catchment group. And that's been a really interesting process because that's brought together all of the, the um, people within not only the governance group, but the steering group. And uh, it was interesting seeing actually Elliot's um, branding with the, with, the, with the logo with the feather and the, the Maori um, art entwined. And we've got something actually relatively similar to that. So it was kind of interesting to see that. So branding is important so that people within the community, not just the, the catchment, but within the wider community, 
um, can start to recognize that and understand that um, you know this is this is something that's really happening this is something i need to keep an eye open for and it goes out on all your newsletters it goes on your website it goes on your t-shirt if you've got one um so that it, it keeps enforcing that message that you're in the community and you're doing good um and the communications um really key just not keeping people in the dark so initially you know it took some time for us to get the the funding and the trust deed up and running because it was a constant um, effort of going backwards and forwards, checking every single sentence, going back to the lawyers, checking with iwi, checking with MFE, MPI, and making sure that everybody was happy. But I think in the long term, that's been um, very beneficial and it's paid off because everybody is happy with that document. But just keeping the message out to the community. So, you know, when they, when they show signs of disengagement, because they're sort of saying, what's taking so long, um, that they have to understand that um, there is a process to follow and if you don't follow that process you end up with the risk of not being resilient and not being sustainable and people dropping off um, and the last thing I'd like to say is if anybody's got any ideas about um, good things to look for bad things to look for in community trustees that's the process that we're going through at the moment so we've got a lot of key stakeholder trustees in our governance group but we're now um, directly going out to the community. We're looking for a couple of community trustees who are resident within the area because we think that's, an, that's a really key, important step for us now going forward. Excellent, that's a good point. Um, Elliot, your thoughts around uh, one last parting sort of thought you'd like to bring up? Yeah, just a couple of things. Um, I, I mentioned it earlier, but the, having the oversight and the legal entity of T Tasman Environmental Trust and that's the logo that, uh, that you're talking about, Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, I'm using the trust logo because I haven't had time to develop one for the project more than anything, but that's a consistent brand that is not associated with council. So it's a softer approach to landowners as well. But the trust is a key um, factor of the success of, of a big project like this, providing some oversight, some guidance around reporting and having other projects that are going on as well to draw on experience from. Um, but something that just wasn't mentioned today was um, as well as working with the community and your catchment and, and the funders and everyone, you're working with a lot of suppliers and they might not necessarily be within the catchment. Talking about the nurseries, the fencing contractors, the suppliers of, uh, of plant guards or, or, or fertilizer tablets or wh whatever you're using and they might be on the fringes but um, a lot of these funded projects are a great opportunity for some of those business businesses to take a risk and employ new staff or expand on a new piece of equipment. And um, so working with your suppliers and looking after them, uh, I think is really key, making sure you're getting eco source plants if it's a consideration around expanding bush blocks and having good good supplier relationships, I think is a key key thing that people should be thinking about as well. Actually, that's a great point because it, it, it supports the succession part of the equation as well, doesn't it? Because it can lead on to um, something that lives beyond a particular project. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, ben, what's your thoughts around that? Any, any, what's your last sort of, Jim? Uh, so I guess my, I guess I'd probably like to close with, um, I guess the number of people on the call just looking to get set up or looking to um, to take the catchment groups or groups to the next step. So I, I'll just share a couple of things of our experience. Um, it became really obvious to us quite early on that if we were going to rely on volunteers, that we probably wouldn't have lasted that long. The, the, the pressure, I guess, the time that was involved, and it, I guess it came from our been involved in regulation early on too it was it was quite high so we realized that very early on that if we were going to be here for any length of time we needed to employ a facilitator or a coordinator to take the pressure off the volunteers um so by getting a we we got a bit of our initial funding actually came from beef and lamb new zealand and if without that i don't think we would have we would have got off the ground um and that enabled us to get a coordinator on board for two days a week. And that enabled us to build some momentum. And it meant that 
the volunteers weren't getting burnt out. That group was able to, to keep going. Um, so to get a coordinator, we needed a legal entity. So I'd encourage everyone who doesn't to get a legal entity, whether it's an incorporated society or a trust. I think they both operate, give a very similar effect. Um, there are some subtle differences, which you'll need to get some, um, some advice on. But one of those two would probably be the best. Um, and that gives you the ability to apply for funding and handle finances, which in my opinion, if you're going to um, have any longevity and if you're going to achieve or, or grow, you're going to have to get those things in place. Um, so because we had that in place and because we had a bit of a track record, when funding did start to become available, we were in a position to apply for it and, and get going there. And that's, that's what's really driven our growth from 100 members to 300 members. Um, and it's really driven what we've been able to offer. So it was those steps early on is take the pressure off the volunteers, get someone employed, get a formal structure, legal structure um, that, that set us in motion. And, and now it's got a fair bit of momentum of its own. Um, and once you've got a bit of momentum and you're, you've got a, I mean, I keep coming back to a value proposition, which might sound a bit um, corporate, but we, we're offering something to our members that they can't get anywhere else in, in, a, in an environment that they trust. And so that's brought people to us to be involved and they, it means we've got people wanting to be involved in our committee now. And they know they don't come in and they get chucked a suitcase with a whole lot of stuff that they've got to do every night. They know they're there as governance and to do, and it's not going to be too onerous. That's a really great point. A lot, a lot, a lot caught up in that comment. Thank you very much, Ben. And I think you know, key to that really is having expectations about what people are going to be asked to do and what they're agreeing to do at the various levels within the group. That's really good. Really good. Um, Emma, you still with us? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Hey, um, yeah. And I think it's for me. It's like there's lots of different ways to skin a cat, right? There's um, probably the the lower input model and then you've got um, um, people like our catchment which have got heaps of money and it's amazing um, don't try and copy anyone create your own journey um, it, there's lots of different ways to do it and um, it'll be awesome because everyone's got different challenges right and then the other one I'd say is like the, the catchment groups are amazing right like there's everyone's a vol like there's so many volunteers involved but one thing I would say is like burnout is a thing and what's your passion like passion has a way of running away and you can find yourself down a rabbit hole trying to pursue like a funding application, trying to pursue this, pursue that. Um, it, it, is, um, it is an amazing space and it, it's really cool to be tied up in, but that's something you've just got to watch. And uh, the other thing was, um, 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 I'll just pick up on that. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's them. why it's good to have it's good to have a governance group on board, right? Because they can help keep that big picture yeah. look at it and, and, and harness the passion in a, in a productive and efficient way that doesn't get tangled up with paperwork. It lets people get on and do. Um, yeah. Hopefully, that, hopefully there's a good summary for you there, Emma. Um, Jane, <laughs> any Jane, any thoughts or last thoughts? Uh, thanks, Tony. So my, my, I guess, final thoughts are, um, and it's really interesting, Emma said, you know, you've got to be careful you're not sort of going down a whole lot of different pathways. And I guess because we... Uh, um, covering a wide network of an area and we're trying to do a number of different smaller projects rather than one flagship project what's happened is a couple of things it's almost it's sort of the little red hen effect so it was really really hard and Ben mentioned this before to get things started for the first four or five years gosh there was a lot of soul searching and um, we didn't have a coordinator we knew we had a role to play we weren't too sure what that role was um, and, and then suddenly, um, when we did get the recipe right, um, you know, it was difficult to get people on board to, to help put ingredients into the recipe, but then everyone wants to eat the cake. Now, that I don't mean that rudely. I just mean that um, it's, it's just an observation rather than a criticism. Now, the difficult thing we have now is that we have found ourselves at least a couple of times trying to be everything to everyone. And so we've had so many... Uh, people come to us to say, can you do this project? Would you look at this? 
And for a while there, you get really caught up in it and go, yes, of course we can, we can take on the world. But actually, um, since we've been really, and again, I've had to go on about this, but really clear in terms of what our pillars are for our work streams that can't go out, lie underneath those pillars, um, we've had sort of a, a, well, we've called it the drafting gate concept. So when, when something comes across the table to us, does that fit in with one of these pillars? Yes. Uh, if not, why not? Um, and it becomes really clear, especially it, it empowers your volunteers to make, not that they're making those decisions on their own, but usually if they come to one of the, um, you know, the chair, chair, et cetera, or the steering group to say, I think this is a good project because of this, they've already made that decision because it's very, very clear whether that fits into our, I guess, our modus operandi or our future modus operandi or not. So we're not getting continuously bombed, or we are still getting you know, approached a lot, which is great. But mm. um, in terms of feeling overwhelmed and trying to do everything, um, we've been pretty clear in that. Uh, yeah, so that's that's from me. Thank you. That's brilliant. Uh, thank you. Um, and actually, just before I do start to thank all the panellists, um, we're just about on time. And I'm going to call on Tiawa in, in a minute to help us wrap things up formally. Um, but just what I'd like to do, I know you know how to use the chat box. Now's a chance for everyone just to chuck in maybe a point or two, something that you uh, learned today that's been really useful or surprising to you or something that you can you can take home and use straight away, something that stood out or equally maybe something that is still a big gap for you um, and something you'd like to know more about. So if you could just take a, a few seconds to do that um, and then as we do that, I'll... Um, I'll start to thank the panellists uh, for their time, but more so for their passion and their clear enthusiasm for this particular topic. Um, thank you on behalf of the rest of us who um, are learning following some of your earlier lessons and, and things that you've been able to share today. So um, that's been really, really powerful stuff. And I know it will live on a, through this recording, but also through some of the messages and notes that will follow this, but equally uh, from what the individual participants um, have benefited from just by hearing um, your, your guys' stories and, and what you've been able to do. So um, I'm just starting to look now at some of these comments here, the pillar idea, that's great. Crafting gates, that's excellent. Yeah, there's plenty of good things to consider. Um, look, I haven't really got a chance to read those right now, but um, Thank you again, everybody, for participating, uh, both um, as an attendee, and hopefully this has been the start of a discussion for you, and you'll know where to go to, to perhaps find out more information. We certainly look forward to seeing you at the um, National Catchments Forum later in the year. That, that This is a really, a really good uh, lead-in for that, so thank you very much. Um, and now, just on behalf of myself and the panel and Landcare Trust, I'd just like to hand over to Tiao. Will you be able to wrap, um, wrap up for us now, Tiao? Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ngā mihi ki a koe a Tony i te rangatiro o te rā, uh, ngā mihi te kaikōrero o tēnei kaupapa, mauri ora i te whānau o te wai paunamu, uh, nō reira uh, he whakakapi uh, i tēnei hui, ka inoi tātou, Ko rangi ko papa ka puta, ko rongo ko tāne māhuta, ko tāngaro, ko tui mā tauinga, ka haumi e i tike tike, ko tāwhiri mātea. Tō ki nā ki rangi nui ki runga, ko papa tua anuku ki raro. Ka puta tira tangata ki te whaiao, ki te o mārama, a tīhei, mauri ora. Mauri ora i te iwi. Kia ora kaini. Lovely. Thank you very much. And thank you to the panel. And thank you very much to those of you at home. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.